And so we're looking at Amos chapter 1 and 2 today uh, in an overview fashion. As you can tell, there's nine chapters in Amos, and uh, we're only spending seven weeks in it, so we're going to have to pick our battles. But uh, today we're going to do an overview of chapters 1 and 2, and you'll see why that works. I want you to think about something. Put yourself in a scenario for me, all right? Imagine like there's a VR headset on your head, all right? So you're, I'm going to put you in a scene. You're outside some outdoor place. It's hot. It's muggy. Actually, you're just right out there. No. Uh, you're by yourself walking in the woods, and it looks like something out of the Lion King, the African bush, okay? There are trees, bushes all around. You're unarmed. You're not really sure where you are or where shelter is. Now, what would be the most terrifying sound a person could hear in that situation? <laughs> I believe that one alone. I've thought about it. <laughs> Thank you, Ronald Reagan. I, as I thought about it, there are probably a handful of really good answers to this, but for the sake of today's message, I want to imagine that you hear the sound of a really big cat. You know what I'm talking about. Not a house cat. I'm talking about a lion and a tiger with that, you know, that first, that low purr that's kind of lets you know the, the base, you can feel it in your feet, and then all of a sudden that terrible shriek. It's like an MGM movie is starting. And, uh, you know, I looked that up this week. I was going to use that as my intro, but I want to tell you some info that I found. That's actually a tiger's growl over the top of that lion. Did you know that? I found that out. Sometime in like the 60s or 70s, I can't remember, they, they decided the tiger had a more menacing growl. So anyway, fun fact, but back to the stuff here. Imagine the sound of a 500-pound lion with teeth and claws the size of steak knives with that low-end rumble, high-end shriek, and you just, you, what are you going to do? You can't climb a tree. They can climb a tree. You can't run faster than they can. You can't fight back with those claws, even if you stopped the face of the lion, which you wouldn't. The claws would tear you up. Playing dead is what you do with bears. I don't think you do that with lions. So for 99% of people out there, the sound alone would rightfully evoke a sense of terror in you and dread. Now, imagine how foolish it would be in that jungle scene, in that scenario, if you heard the same sound, that same awful shriek, and you thought, eh, that's probably for somebody else. The lion's probably hunting somebody else. That can't, I mean, it can't be me. It can't be me. You hear it 10 feet away behind a bush. You hear the, the growl beginning to form. Ah, there's probably somebody else 10 feet that way that he's looking at, right? That's crazy, right? Well, what I want you to see in today's passage will be a good reminder that we are actually very capable of doing that with God. Minor prophets are known for one common theme. If you had to put one theme on all the prophets, it would be this. Judgment is coming. That's the, the single theme. God's people had turned against him, rebelled, broke covenant, went further from his desires, and God raised up prophets to speak for him. Sometimes the message was, turn back, repent, and I will relent from my punishment. But sometimes it was, punishment's just coming. And that was what we're going to probably see today. God, the sovereign of all the earth, deeply cares about you, his covenant people, he cares that you love him. He cares that you honor him. And his faithfulness to us is not an opportunity for us to stray away from him. The title of today's message is this. Are you roaring at me? So before we look at God's word, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask you today to move in this passage, in these chapters often overlooked. Lord, would you teach us something from your word? Lord, not just academic knowledge, but something that would strike our hearts today, spoken hundreds of years ago by your prophet Amos. Lord, would it speak even today? I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Amos chapter 1. This is one of those days where a paper Bible is going to work better. So if you don't have one and you kind of depend on the screen, we do have paper Bibles right in front of you. They're still there. Um, last week, we learned about Amos, a farmer from South Judah, 
whom God called to go north into Israel to preach to them. Remember, it was simultaneously an evil time and a materially prosperous time. That is possible. They were still coasting off their past blessings of David and Solomon while the evil king Jeroboam II was ruling as a gifted military commander and an economy booster. But as you'll see, God was not pleased with this because their prosperity did not cause them to look to the giver of the gift. Look with me. We're going to review 1-1 in Amos, and then verse 2 is really where we're going first. So in case you weren't here last week, I want you to hear the intro. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now onto the new stuff. Verse 2. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. So we're going to pause there. In case there was any doubt about how this is going to go, you know how you have a meeting with somebody and you're not really sure what direction it's going to go, and then within about 10 seconds, you're like, oh, it's a bad meeting. Okay, this is one of those, okay? So Amos pretty much lets you know the feel right from the beginning. The first thing I want you to see as we study this passage today, number one point in our outline, is the roar of retribution. If you're taking notes, the roar of retribution. So here in verse 2, we have our introduction and style to the feel, the vibe of Amos, which we're getting a lot of literary devices already. Uh, we haven't, I don't think, studied a prophetic book together as a church with me here, and so uh, this is a good introduction to prophecy and poetry. You get a lot of poetry in prophecy, so I want you to know that. Um, so th- this is why I had you imagine that lion, tiger sound in the jungle, the sound of imminent doom and terror that fills you, knowing that you're about to face off against a foe that you cannot defeat. Uh, Amos starts with that. That's the starting line of this. The Lord roars from Zion. If your Bible employs the all caps, Lord, L-O-R-D, how many of you in your paper Bible or uh, in your digital Bible, where it says the word Lord is caps, L-O-R-D, all caps? Okay, let me just tell you what that is, because some people don't know. That's your Bible translator talking to you, letting you know that behind that English word Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh, okay? Sometimes there's different words for God, you know, Adonai, all right? So there's different words for God all over. When it's all caps Lord, they're telling you, that is Yahweh uh, behind it. So Yahweh roars from Zion. You might also note that the location of the roar is not from the north. It's not from the, the temple at Bethel. It's not from one of the high places. It's not on Mount Carmel. It's not from the sea. The voice of Yahweh thunders from Zion, which refers to the holy city of Jerusalem in the south. Lastly, in this simple phrase, we look at the word roar. The Hebrew word yesag is used other places in scripture to describe both the literal roar of an actual lion or the thunderous sound of an approaching storm. But either way, the intent of this word is to relay a feeling of dread and terror. So let me just ask before we get too far into the message, this is a good stopping point for us. Do you worship the God, Yahweh, who roars from Zion? Is that the God that you worship? Or have you bought into the idea that God is your personal genie, your life coach, your buddy, who never asks you to do anything, never gets upset at your sin, and never disciplines you when you stray? Is that your God? If you worship a God like that, a God who is indifferent towards sin, your God may purr from the litter box, but he certainly does not roar from Zion. The God of the Bible comes on the clouds in glory. He uh, comes on the mountains that makes them tremble. He decimates the armies of the earth with a sword in his mouth. That is who God is. And yes, now let's temper this. Yes, our relationship with Almighty God changes when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, Lord, and mediator. Yes, our relationship to God is no longer based upon fear and dread because perfect love casts out fear. But I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, don't get too comfortable There ought to be a healthy respect and reverence in the way that we think about God. Just because he's our Abba Father, and he is, doesn't mean that he ceases to be the Lion of Judah. Okay, got to remember that. Yahweh God roars from Zion in the prophet Amos. The second half of verse 2 says, 
the pastures of the shepherds mourn, the top of Carmel withers. Now, this is covenant imagery of the drying up of a blessing. The old covenant with Moses was simple. If you obey me and keep my commands, I will bless you. If you don't, I will curse you. Simple. And here is the picture of both a low place, a pasture, and a high up place, a mountaintop, drying up and becoming parched, brown, and brittle. The blessing was being revoked because of the disobedience of God's people. Now, we don't really yet know what they're in trouble for. I don't know if your parents have ever done that to you or parents, you pulled that trick where you let them know they're in trouble before you even tell them what it's about. You kind of lead with the anger, all right? So that's what's happening here. We, we, don't, we know a little because of last week's message. I, I jumped into chapter 7 a bit, but we don't really know what Israel's problem is at this point. All we have is this introduction that's very fearful. So what you're going to see now in the prophetic genre, okay, we're in genre now, the prophetic genre is called oracles of judgment, okay? This is an oracle of judgment. So we're going to look at verse 3. Now, I want you to see this as a template because there's more of these. This is, we're just going to look at the first one, but there's eight, all right? So the first one in verse 3, thus says the Lord. That's a classic prophet line, okay? Learn that. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben Hadad. Now, that may not mean much to you right now. I understand that. But I want you to see this as a template, okay? So there are eight of these oracles, and uh, we're not, we can't look in the history of each one of them. That's a, a long historical look into each one. But I want to show you the template, the highlights, and give you the big picture of what God is doing. So, number two in our outline, moving along, number two, we're going to see the circle of sovereignty. We're going to see God's sovereignty displayed amongst the nations in these judgment oracles. So you'll notice if you scan, and you're, this is where the paper Bible comes in, okay? If you scan from verse 3 in chapter 1 all the way into chapter 2, there's a formula to these judgments. Each paragraph starts the same way. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of blank insert sitting here, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because, and then you insert the unique sin of that city. And then there's a reference to fire of destruction coming as the judgment. It's the same for everyone. All you switch out is the name of the city and what they did. Okay? So, I know you're thinking, what's for three and for four, right? That's the number one thing you're probably thinking about. What is that? It's a Hebrew thing. I'll say that first. To symbolize the running out of patience. Maybe, maybe y'all have uh, used this. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. That, it's that just with three and four, okay? So we, we have that in the Proverbs as well. You'll see that with uh, six sins and for seven and things like that. So this is just a Hebrew thing to show the kind of running out of patience, Okay, so let's look at the specifics of these judgments. Verse 3, the target is on Damascus, a city of the Arameans, modern-day Syria. All right, this is not Israel. This is a pagan nation in no way connected to Israel. And God is judging them through Amos. So what did they do? You can see it there. They threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Now, this sounds like a war crime to me of what this is. Gilead was a small little territory, and so either the Arameans literally tortured people with iron sledges, or their conquest was so over the top that this was a metaphor to describe it. Either way, what they did displeased the Lord. Next is in verse 6, Gaza. Well, Gaza is a Philistine city. Um, their sin was that they carried into exile a whole people and delivered them to Edom. So it is very likely that this refers to a slave trade done by kidnapping. This greatly angered the Lord, and he says, I will turn my hand against them, and the remnants of the Philistines will perish. So the Philistines were eventually exterminated by the Assyrians and finished off by the Maccabees. So there are no references, maybe you've noticed in your New Testament, to the Philistines. That's why. Next, in verse 9, is Tyre, a 
city of the Phoenicians. This is a Phoenician city. The same charge is made against Tyre. They sold people to Edom. So you know Edom is going to not get off the hook at some point, right? So two, two nations are selling to Edom. Uh, so historical records show us that Tyre did capture and sell Israelites to Edom. Uh, and this is particularly heinous because Edom was supposed to be a friendly nation uh, historically. Who did Edom descend from ultimately? Bible trivia. Esau. So they trace their lineage through Esau. Uh, so they're supposed to be a friendly relationship, but there just wasn't. Um, ultimately, Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great, and many of their people were sold into Greek slavery. So that sin continued on, uh, but it was put upon them. In verse 11, there's the judgment on Edom, a smaller neighboring nation of Israel. They were supposed to be a brother, but consistently through their history, they warred against Israel. They were the thorn in their side. They never stopped. And so God eventually judges them. And by the way, if you want to know what the prophet Obadiah's entire book about, it's really short, by the way. You could read it in like one sitting. Uh, that's the destruction of Edom prophecy in Obadiah. Okay. Verse 13, the judgment on the Ammonites descended from, anybody know where the Ammonites came from? This is a little harder. I know you don't want to say it because it's kind of weird, right? This is from the relationship with Lot when he was drunk with his daughters. So if you remember that terrible story in Genesis, Lot was tricked into drunkenness by his daughters, and uh, they laid with him, and two nations were birthed from that. One of them was the Ammonites. Uh, we see that sin continuing on. This is a, the worst, probably, most heinous one of, of all these judgments. Verse 13 will tell you that they ripped open pregnant women in Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. Sadly, we know that this was a tactic of border towns from history. Uh, border towns would often do something to keep the other person afraid of being your neighbor. So they would do something just terrible to evoke a fear of, we better not even move next to that border. And so this was what Ammon did. Sadly, um, we know, uh, well, ultimately, they were destroyed by the Assyrians um, who utterly destroyed them. I mean, you don't hear about the Ammonites anymore. They didn't make it out. The Assyrians destroyed them. In verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, we see the judgment on the other nation from the same descendant of Lot, Moab, the judgment is for an act of war that went too far. This is, seems like a really specific thing. If you read it, we don't really know exactly what it is. It says that the king of Edom's bones were turned or, or burned to lime. So the Jewish Targums posit that this means that the tomb of Edom was desecrated and his body was dug up and burned and that his ashes were used to paint the side of buildings. So even though Edom was an evil empire, God does not enjoy this sadistic treatment of image bearers of God. That's a good thing to remember. The Assyrians would be the judgment arm of God against the Moabites for this. Now, at this point, it's good. That's, all the, that's the main ones there. It's good to step back and look at this big picture of what's happening. Amos stands up to... By the way, that's why people don't preach the prophets. Let me just say right there. All right? That's why, right there. So, uh, Amos stands up to prophesy to Israel... The first three cities listed, completely foreign, completely foreign cities, Damascus, Gaza, and Tyre. Those are all nations, zero connection to Israel. Then there were three nations that had become pagan, but had a familial relationship to Israel, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Now, if you were to look at this on a map, as we named each one, you would see almost like a concentric circle forming. Uh, you would see... Kind of like a, if you're tightening um, like a hubcap or something, you know, where you move up here, then you move over here, then you move over here, then over here, and it just tightens toward the middle. Not to mention, here comes number seven. So typically in the list, seven was the whammy, okay? That was just a Hebrew number is seven. So chapter two, verse four, who's on the chopping block? Judah. Okay. Now, if you're in Israel... The northern kingdom, you're feeling pretty good about yourself right now, aren't you? Because you went through that whole list, and number seven, again, the Hebrew number is Judah, not you, it's Judah. So, 
you're probably thinking, if you're listening to Amos' sermon here, wow, that's what this was building to? Whoo! Amos just came all the way up here to zing Judah. Whoo! We're in the clear, boys. That's right. Look at all you sinners around us. We are still good. We're still on top. We are the chosen people. May God continue to burn you all. That's probably how they felt, right? But verse 6 comes. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. What you just witnessed was the prophetic setting of a trap. It is now clear to the listener of this message that though other nations would be judged for real, the primary nation in the crosshairs of Amos' message is God's own people, the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, before we move on to the specifics of Israel's judgment, there are two points that I think are worth making before we move on. We learned some things about God in Amos 1 and 2. First, we have an affirmation that Yahweh God is the God, not just of Israel, but of the entire world. Every nation on the face of the earth is accountable to him, even though they did not stand with Moses on the mountain and receive the law, even though they did not walk with Abraham through the covenant, through the animals. God is sovereign over all nations. God is the sovereign monarch of this universe. Do you believe that? Yahweh God is not just the Lord of the Christians or the nations who fear him governmentally or individually. He is the Lord of all. And he holds the right to judge nations that do not even recognize his lordship. You know, that's an interesting thing about lordship, actually. Jesus is Lord of your life, whether you recognize him to be Lord or not. When you make Jesus Lord of your life, you are not creating a new reality that did not exist before. You are acknowledging something that is already a reality. Secondly, we learned that being God's chosen people does not exempt you from the discipline of the Lord. God is big enough and omniscient enough to care about your sins and my sins as well as the atrocities of this world. He doesn't get too busy because there's things going on other places. Just because there's bad out there doesn't mean there's not bad in here. In fact, I would say that is a routine tactic of the devil in our lives to convince us that the truly bad people in the world is everyone out there but not us. That's a tactic of the devil. The sins of Moab and Gaza did not exempt Israel and Judah from their sins. God doesn't judge by comparison standards. Hear that, kids? Listen up, youth, college. God's judgment is not based on comparison of your best friend. That is not how God judges. He judges by the standard of his own holiness. And praise God that Jesus satisfied that holiness and lived it out and died for the removal of all the ways that we fail to meet it. We have seen the roar of retribution, number one, the circle of sovereignty, number two, and now we're going to see what Israel did, number three, the charge of culpability. We got the thesaurus out for that one. Now that the trap has been set, it's time to look at an overview of really what will the next five messages be about. This is the initial charge. It's like an opening argument in a court case that God makes against Israel. We're going to read Amos 2, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, A man and his father go into the same girl, so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. That is the initial charge laid out by God against Israel. There are a handful of accusations here that become categories of sin. 
throughout Amos. First, you're going to notice an obvious theme of exploitation. That will be a major theme in the book of Amos. Every major commentary that I've read said that there had developed a ruling elite class in Israel in these days. And as we know, there's nothing inherently evil about wealth, about money that is earned through honest means. Amos himself was an owner of livestock. He had many fields with sycamore figs. All right, we read that last week. He was not a poor man. Perhaps you've written a best-selling book or you've written a hit song and it goes to number one and you make money. Is that wrong? Are you wrong for that? No, you, you, you just created something great and people bought it. Perhaps you've worked a middle-class job your entire life, saved up for years, lived below your means, invested wisely, and you saved up some money. That is very, I just want you to hear that, that is a very different thing than what is being described here. This is describing, now this happens too, this is describing the gaining of wealth directly related to the suffering and dishonest treatment of others, especially the poor who have less means to protect themselves. Verse 6 says, They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. So let me tell you what that means. We have debt today, right? Uh, But the consequences of being in debt are far different today than they were then. I want you to imagine, maybe you don't have to imagine, I want you to imagine that you can't make your student loan payment or that you go upside down on your home mortgage and you get sold into slavery. Think about that. That's exactly what was happening in Israel, except in many cases, uh, it was while you were making the payments on time. Now that's pretty bad. That's what you call unjust, right? The righteous sold for silver, that phrase. This refers to those entering into a contract or a business deal with debt. They were making the payments. That's what the word righteous means. And they were good for the money, but still ended up being sold into slavery while making the payments. So uh, that's the first phrase. The second, the needy sold for a pair of sandals. This refers to a poor person sold into slavery over an inconsequential price, such as a pair of sandals. Can you imagine being sold into slavery because you couldn't come up with $10? That was happening. That was happening in Israel. They trampled the poor into the dust. And this was never supposed to happen in Israel. Things were supposed to be different. Let me give you a a quotation from the law of God, Leviticus 25, 39, because I want you to see what the law really is. Sometimes we get a twisted view of what the law is. I want you to see this, Leviticus 25, 39. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession, that means the land, of his fathers. So what was happening was never supposed to happen. In verse 7, we see, moving on, that sexual sin had become commonplace in Israel. A father and a son were in a sexual relationship with the same woman. And like our day to day, the sexual ethic had become, as long as it's between two consenting adults, do what makes you happy. That's what we hear today, right? The Word of God says it differently than that, that your life is not your own. Your body is not your own. You don't make the rules, and God's holy name will not be profaned. When the Word of God is abandoned in a culture, we know this, Sexual sin is always the first wave to come. In verse 8, we see that there was a phrase used, taken in pledge. I had to study on this one. The closest practice today is uh, to taking in pledge is what we call collateral. You know what collateral is? So, for example, if you borrow my car today, and I'm kind of sketchy about you, and I'm not 100% sure you're going to bring it back, I might take something from you that's valuable. Like, all right, give give me your wedding ring. And, and I'll give that to you when you bring my car back, okay? Or, hey, uh, you know that uh, autographed Paul McCartney Beatles record on your shelf? Leave that with me, and when you bring the car back, I'll give that back to you. So that's what we call collateral today. That's the closest thing to what this pledge was. 
So in, in these days, they would do business like this. It, it, not everyone was just sitting around in mud huts, okay? Business was happening in the ancient world. Uh, the wealthy elites were taking advantage of the poor and taking as collateral a poor man's one and only outer garment. This would be the equivalent of uh, someone here in, in the upper class entering into a deal with a homeless man on the street and taking his only pair of clothes as collateral and him sleeping naked on the street. This would be the, the equivalent of that. They were taking these garments and using them, not just, not just using them to wear them, they were, this gets bad, they were laying them down in the temples as mats for themselves for their illicit sexual acts in the temples made to false gods. So it's a stolen, well, it's, it's a, an, a not right practice of taking a poor man's one garment, then you lay down and you have bad sexual uh, ethics happening, and then you have in front of false gods, like it's just spiraling at this point. It's just darkness. Do you know in the law you weren't even supposed to take a poor man's cloak overnight? I want to show you this again, just to show you what the law is. Exodus twenty two twenty six says, if you ever take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. In what else shall he sleep? If he cries to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. That's the, that's the, the law we hear so much bad things about. God did not like the idea of taking a poor man's only cloak as collateral and having him sleep in the cold overnight. That's a good God, isn't it? Additionally, in verse 8, we see they were exacting fines of wine against people. Now, that's strange to... to the wine tax, I mean, that's a very strange thing when you get in trouble and say, all right, I'm going to need you to give me some wine for that. Uh, that's weird. Uh, so that was happening, and it was a very convenient tax because it aided in their strange drunken temple orgies that they were getting involved in, and it was all a part of the same terrible stuff happening. So this is the initial charge levied by God. Now you know what's coming. You know what this book is about. But I would like to conclude this message today with the fourth and final point that I think really shows you one more aspect of the character of God. That's number four, the contempt of covenant. Now, you would expect right after all these terrible charges were laid out that God would just explode and consume in fire and destroy. And, and that does come later. But the next section is a little window into God's heart that I want you to see. Read verse 9 through 11 in chapter 2 with me. God says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars and who was strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. And it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up your sons for prophets, some of your sons for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? What is that? Why is that there? Why is this recorded if the goal is just to deliver judgment? It's because within the roar of the lion, there is a tinge of sorrow and pain. He roars in judgment and power. But I want you to know, God is hurt by the broken covenant. This is not detached rage from a detached God. This judgment is done in sorrow. Sovereign God wants his people to know they broke the marriage covenant. He wants them to know that they hurt him. God says, remember all that I've done for you? I destroyed the nations who were mightier than you. I went before you. I took care of the Amorites. You couldn't beat them. I beat them. I gave you the best land in this whole place. I led you out of Egypt. I got you out of slavery. I broke you out. We traveled for 40 years together in the wilderness. Before there was a nation, it was just us wandering in the wilderness together. I gave you prophets. I gave you Nazarites. You didn't listen to one of them. God is reminding Israel that their judgment is different. No other nation got a follow-up from God about how it hurt him to do this to them. He is mourning as he judges, and maybe, parents, you know what that feels like. Here's where this series is headed, in a nutshell. 
God has blessed us and given us much. I mean, all of us here, every single one of us here. He has been faithful to you. Do you use God's faithfulness and goodness and provision as an opportunity to stray from him and take advantage of his goodness? Or do you remain faithful to him because of the gratitude and worship that fill your heart? Whether it's a nation or a church or a person, God may choose to rain down blessing and favor and provision and grace upon you for a time, but the question is, what will you do with that? Will you get comfortable? Will you pursue sin in what appears to be a lax time? Will you test God's patience? Will you assume that God's real punishment is for those sinners out there? but not for the sinners in here. Don't use God's past faithfulness to you as an excuse to coast into your future. Just like Israel looked back, they looked back at Moses and the Exodus as their it's all been done moment. We today can look back at the cross and the empty tomb as our it is finished moment and then feel tempted to trample upon the free gift of grace that has been given to us in Christ. The gospel that Jesus died to atone for your sin and to reconcile you to God can sound very convenient for you. But remember, the message of Amos is that even in the face of blinding goodness of God and prosperity, remain faithful to him. Remain faithful on the peak, just as you would in the valley. Pray with me.